Well, good morning. We're glad you're all here today, and uh, we are in part four of this series. I, I absolutely have loved this series. I, I trust that you're enjoying it too, and it's been meaningful for you, and, and uh, perhaps a little thought-provoking, a bit challenging for you. We called it Starting Point, and I trust that you have been uh, doing just that, looking at the starting points in your life. The premise of this series is simply that faith has a starting point. And sometimes we don't think about the fact that faith has a starting point. Um, and once upon a time, perhaps, you weren't sure what to believe. And then somebody came along and said, hey, believe this. Maybe it was your dad or it was your mom or, or as a grandparent or somebody. And maybe they took you to church and, and you were taught. Maybe it was Sunday school or something. And you were taught things like God is good and God is great and, you know, all those things. And kind of we grew up a little bit longer and then we went to high school and we started you know wandering a little bit perhaps in terms of our lifestyle and then college and all of the intellect and the thinking with college and all that stuff and then somehow we became adults and we settled back into responsible living and some of you are still trying to figure this all out today and, and we know that and we're glad that you're here and whether you're listening online or whether you're here in the audience with us today wherever you are at some point you said, you know what, I'm going to believe this. Or you said, I'm not going to believe this. And along the way, if you were like me, you heard these words, well, Christians don't do that. Or Christians do this. And, and there, I would get this, and I still get this sometimes, and they say, well, this is what Christians are, and I'll, I'll listen to them and I'll go, Really? Is that what I am? Is that your perception of what I am? And there's all the stereotypes and there's the reputation and the branding and some of it we like and some of it we're like, no, 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 don't put that on us. Don't put that on me because I don't really believe that. And I, some of you decided, you know what, I don't like that. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it up as I go. And I'm going to take a little bit of this, and I take a little bit of that, and I'm going to believe this, but I don't believe that, but I do believe this. This is really good. This fits with me. That, not so much. So I'm not going to have as much of that. And it's like, it's like you look at your faith kind of like, a, like at a buffet and how, what, how you're going to make it up as you go along. And I admit that, that a lot of it can be a little bit confusing. I get that. And for the most part, I really don't think that people just decide, well, you know what? I'm not going to believe anymore. I'm just going to kind of walk away from my childhood faith. I don't think it happens like that. I think rather it gets chiseled away. It's, it, it just kind of becomes a little bit irrelevant, a little bit, and that doesn't fit anymore, my experiences. And, and then, of course, you get married or you're hoping to get married, and then you get kids and you're finishing up college and all those things, and you get busy. And it's, it's not like you spend a lot of time thinking about it anyways, and life just gets so busy. But every once in a while whether it be a circumstance or maybe you're just by yourself, something starts to pull. Something inside, and, and maybe it's your heart, maybe it's your emotions, but something happens and, and you begin to say, what if it's important? I mean, what if all of this really is important? And, and if it is important, where would I start? How would I get a fresh beginning? And, and that's really what this series is all about. How do we as adults start again? And I, I trust that you have uh, uh, watched or listened to the other messages. If you haven't, we have our website. It's not, they're also on our app. And, and it's important that you kind of track it because each one kind of builds on itself. And today we're going to tackle probably one of the biggest questions, if you would, or one of the biggest wrestling spots uh, along the way when it comes to faith. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about the role of rules. Say that with me. The role of rules. Because in every religion, there are rules. And in every religion, there's a rule maker. And the problem with the rules and the rule maker is that it's not me. I want to be the rule maker. You want to be the rule maker. This is the problem. This is the problem. It never gets to be us, does it? It's always somebody else making up the rules. And maybe that's why you drifted. Maybe it was kind of like, like leaving home. It feels like we're growing up and we, we don't want to listen to mom or dad anymore. And so we make up our own belief or we start to follow our own rules. And that doesn't go well with mom or especially dad. I did that. And by age 16, I decided that I didn't want to follow my dad's rules. And so I moved out on my own and put myself through the balance of high school. And I got my own place and had to work extra hard just to cover all 
all of those expenses. And, and, and the funny thing is, is after a few years of doing the things my own way and following my own rules, I found out that my way wasn't, wasn't always a good way, especially when the rent came in due. And I was only working part-time. And after a few years, I realized that, that life wasn't as clear as I thought it was from the vantage point of my nice warm bed and a fridge full of food and everything was kind of great at mom and dad's house. And, and, and it didn't satisfy me the way I thought it would. And, and slowly, as I got a couple of years into this, I began to realize that, that my dad, my mom, they were... They were... They were... My mom and dad were, I still can't say it. (laughs) Stay away from my dad's Facebook, will you? Don't let him know. He's 75 years old, and I've had to come to grips with the fact that my dad was, he was right. Mom was right. And maybe their way was the right way, a better way. And in fact, maybe it was even wise. When it comes to faith, wouldn't it be just great to start your own religion? You know what? I'm going to start my own religion. I'm going to start my own faith. It's going to be my own set of rules. And in every religion, we run up against the rules. There's the five pillars of Islam. There's the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount. Sikhs have a, have a list of rules. Buddhists have principles. Everything has a set of rules. And even within the Christian faith, I grew up Pentecostal, and we have a set of Pentecostal rules, and down the road there are the Baptists, and they have rules, and, and we had ours, and they had theirs, and the Presbyterians had their rules, and the Methodists had rules, and the United, well, we didn't think they had enough rules, because honestly, they were having more, way too much more fun than we were ever allowed to have. But everything was rules for me. When I was growing up, my whole faith was defined by what I didn't do. And every question that I would ask my parents whenever it came down to, well, well, uh, I want to do this, for every why that I had as a child, the answer was always, we don't do that. How many were part of that kind of household? It's like, there was no answer past that. It was just, we don't do that. Faith for me was based on what, what I don't do. And, and a lot of you were raised, you were Catholics, and wow, you were on a whole different level of do's and don't do's. And regardless of whatever your religious tradition was that you were exposed to, there was enough guilt for everybody. I mean, the one thing that I grew up with, there was enough guilt for everybody, enough judgment for everybody, there was enough shame to go around, there was enough to make me feel bad about something each and every week. And so today we want to look at this and ask the question, what's with all the rules? Why is it that so much a part of religion is that there is a set of rules that we want to fight against? And for many of you, it's why you left your faith as your childhood. It's why you decided not to go back to church because you kind of got fed up with feeling like somebody was mad at you all the time or that you weren't doing it right or that, or that uh, someone was always on your case because you didn't measure up. And even worse, the older you got, the found out that the person who was yelling at you with the most amount of rules, some of you found out that they weren't keeping the rules too. How can you tell me to keep the rules that you're not keeping? That's not right. And, and then you experience things where the rules just didn't work in the culture. And the culture was living one way and the rules didn't seem to work with what you had and the framework didn't work for you anymore. So today we want to look at what is the relationship between rules and religion. And that there's a starting point of understanding between the rules and a God who does love us, does care for us, created this world and, and created a plan for us. And the, and the premise of our talk today is that rules always assume a, a kind of relationship. Wherever you have rules, there is a relationship. Wherever you find yourself accountable to a set of rules, you're in some kind of relationship. And I have a few uh, models for you today. The first one is probably the most popular one, and that is the, the family model list of rules. You were born into a family, and at some point, your parents started making rules. Now, they didn't make rules to make you part of the family. You already part of the family. You know what I'm talking about. But they established the rules. They established the rules when you were a kid. They established the rules when you were in high school. And eventually you outgrew the family. You perhaps outgrew the rules. And you're still part of the family, but now you don't have to obey the rules anymore as an adult. But, but when you were growing up as a kid, you had rules. And I remember telling my girls, because Ashley and Gabby growing up in our home, there were lots of times when they would look at different families, even here in the church, and they, they saw their families living in one set of rules, and we had another set of rules, and they were like, Dad, why can't we live like them? Because we don't 
like your rules, we like their rules. Or somehow their perception of the absence of rules, well, how come they get to and we don't get to? And I'd say, well, if you don't like what you don't get to do and you like what they get to do, then why don't you pack your bags and go move in with them? Go be a Schwint if you like. I don't care. <laughs> if you think that's the way you want to have it, you don't have to. But we're a boys, and in boys, this is how we live. And if they want to live however they want to live, that's fine. But we live differently. No, I'm not even going <laughs> to. But parents, you know what I'm talking about. You all had this. You all experienced this. And if you have teenagers in your home, you're experiencing it right now. Every parent knows what I'm talking about here. The rules don't make you part of the family. The rules are because you're a part of the family. I want to say that again. The rules don't make you part of the family, but the rules are because you are part of the family. And so there's a second model, and that's the club model. In the club model, you agree to a certain number of rules or you agree to keep the rules in order to get into the club. So there's an expectation. In order to be accepted, you, have to, you get to enter into the relationship by virtue of your acceptance of the rules and it's given to you by a contract or a document and you read it and if you agree to it, you sign and once you sign, then you've agreed to keep the rules and if you keep the rules, then you're in and if you don't keep the rules, you're what? You're out. It's like when you go to work for a company and the company says, we want to hire you. And they say, okay, but here's what we expect of you. This is your job description. We're going to pay you. But once you accept this contract, you agree to the rules of the company. And in this model, you actually get the rules in order to establish the relationship. And so in the first family model, you are part of the family first and then you, are, uh, you receive the rules and the rules are because you are part of the family. In, the, in, the, in this model, you accept the rules in order to be part of the club or the club model. Now there's a third model and it's kind of the one that's a little bit more kind of out there, but it's the neighborhood association model. Now the neighborhood association model is a, is a model of rules and relationship but you never know where you really stand. You're never quite sure. I mean, you buy a house, you move into the neighborhood, and, and, and you're free to be along to part of the neighborhood, but you have to understand the neighborhood. So, it, it, especially now, we have, we have springtime, and so everybody's out, and, 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 and everybody's kind of redecorating their home. And, and this past weekend, Cheryl decided that she didn't like the color of the front door. And so she decided she was going to repaint the door, and she painted it this incredibly bright blue. I mean blue, as blue as blue could get. And I was just wondering, as she was painting this blue door, I was thinking to myself, I wonder what the neighborhood association is going to think of this door. And it's like, you don't really know what the rules are, but when you move into a neighborhood, you're expected to know the rules. And it's kind of like that. <coughs> um, we don't do that in this neighborhood. That's not the way we do flower beds. That color, that's too blue for this neighborhood. And it reflects on the whole neighborhood, and, 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 and we have to live here. And you know that it's, what, what, if, if you know what's good for you, you're going to fit in. And if you don't pay attention to the rules that nobody has spoken of, but everybody is supposed to know, you start getting, you know, nasty notes in your mailbox, or people start, kind of stare at you when you're going over to the mailbox, or they, you're met with these awkward <coughs> hellos, and, 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 you know, somebody starts smashing your blue bins, or your blue bins just kind of disappear, or the dog starts visiting your side of the property more often. I, I don't know, but it's kind of like you're in and you're out and if you behave, you're in and we can't actually make you out, but we can make you feel like you're out and we'll ice you out so that you don't even want to be in anymore. The point of all of this is, is that wherever you are with the rules and whatever are accountable uh, to the set of rules that you find yourself in, if you take these ideas, the neighborhood association model or, 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 or the, uh, uh, the other models, the family model or, 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 or the business model, all of these things, you lay this on religion and it just gets absolutely nutty. I mean, it gets absolutely crazy because which one is it? Is it your in with God because, of, because uh, 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 no matter what you do, you're in, but, but you have to live by the rules? Or is it, hey, if you behave, you get in, but you got to keep behaving or you're going to get kicked out. 
Or is it, well, you're in because you're a human being and all human beings are in, but every once in a while you're gonna get a note in the mailbox, I'm gonna kick your blue bin around and I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat you bad until you change your life and I'm gonna guilt you to death or shame you to death and, and, and you might be in by virtue of the fact that you're just in, but I'm gonna make you wish you were out. What is it with God? And now when you hear all of this, some of you start thinking with your head and others with your heart because you were taught that you were part of God's family. But you didn't feel like you were in. You never sure you were in. And for other of us, you know what, as a kid, I, I, I was told that I was in, but there were lots of times when I didn't feel I was in because I wasn't keeping up with the rules. And so if I wasn't keeping up the rules, I was made to feel like I was out. Even though I was told that I was in, I still felt like I was out because I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. So we had this thing called the altar call and I had to go to the altar every week and I had to repent of all my sins and get myself all cleaned up so that I could feel in again. Only to mess it all up, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I had a whole new whack of sins that I had to go get rid of so that I could feel in again. And so I was out by Friday, back in by Sunday night, and whew, I would carry on for another week. How many were part of that? You know what I'm talking about. So which one is it, and how do we know? And if you embrace Christianity at some point along the way, you're going to wrestle with this, this, this whole question of how does my behavior line up with God and what God expects of me and when I'm in and, and when I'm out and how in the world am I supposed to know if I'm in or if I'm out? So I want us to wrestle with this a bit today and I want to go back to one of the oldest sets of the laws that were ever given, one of the oldest sets of, uh, of laws given in human history because I think that it's there where we're going to find the kind of the, the framework for the model of well, what God was really talking about. It's, it's a, a common set of laws and we call them the Ten Commandments given to us by Moses, by God, and most of us don't know them all, but we know a few of them. We know there's a few biggies like there's the don't steal, others don't, there's don't kill and and there's something about adultery that that's a big no-no. And, and, and all of these rules, you'll find them in Exodus chapter 20. And I, I just want to tie this into last week. Remember last week we talked about Abraham? And I talked about Abraham, and he was one of the hugest men of the old world religions. And most claim him as the, as the starting point for their faith. And I told you that Abraham was promised by God that he was going to be a great nation. And the problem was is that Abraham was old and uh, actually was past the whole child years. And, and so he, him and his wife, they kind of got panicky. And, and Sarah says to him one day, she says, look, I'm getting too old. I can't have any more children, but my handmaiden can. So why don't you and her go get busy? And maybe you can have some children, and, and, and we'll take care of it that way. Way. So that's what they did. And um, they ended up having a boy, and his name was Ishmael. Now, later on, what happens is that Sarah gets pregnant, and she has a son, and she names him Isaac. So as it turns out, Abraham was going to be this big nation, actually ends up with two sons. Now, here's where it get, gets interesting. I'm going to invite you to, uh, you know, this afternoon, Genesis 16, 17, 18. This is where you're going to find the story. Ishmael grows up, and he actually becomes a great nation, as does Isaac. In Islam, Ishmael is considered the son of blessing. And today, all of the Arab nations are descendants of Ishmael. In Judaism and, and in Christianity, Isaac is considered or called the son of blessing. And Isaac had a son named Jacob, and he had 12 sons that eventually became the 12 tribes of Israel. So think about this. From this point, the two world religions go off in two different directions, but all of the turmoil that we're experiencing to this day, all of the fighting, all of the wars, all of the bombs, it's basically the entire story is a family feud about who is the son of blessing between two brothers and a mom and a dad who didn't listen to the will of God and his promise for their lives. All of it. Rules have, a, have, a, have a, a role to play. Moving on, Israel becomes a great nation, and they end up for a period of time as slaves in Egypt. And again, it's another interesting story. You want to look it up for yourself. But, but for 400 years, this family grows and grows and grows, and it becomes this massive nation, but they're a slave nation. They're, in, they're a slave nation to Egypt. And generation after generation after generation, all they know is slavery. And one day, this man shows up, and his name is Moses. And he goes to Pharaoh, because I know that you all know Yul Brenner and you saw the movie. Moses goes to Pharaoh, and what does he say? He says, hey, Pharaoh, Let my go. you did see the movie. And Pharaoh says, you know what? No, I am not going to let your people go. And Moses says, okay, you asked for it. And all of a sudden, nature just has a big freak out. 
and there's locusts and there's boils and there's frogs and there's ticks and there's hail and, there, and, and all kinds of these things goes on. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. And the weirdest thing about the whole thing is that all of these plagues are pouring out into the area of Egypt, but all of the Egyptians are affected by these plagues, but none of the Israelites are affected by any of it. And the next thing you know, Egypt's entire economy is wrecked. And eventually Pharaoh lets them go. Moses leads them out to Egypt. And three weeks after they, they take off, they end up at Mount Sinai. And now Moses is about to go up and to get God's law. And I remember, it's important to know this. All they knew was slavery. Remember this, 400 years of slavery. They don't have a civil society. They don't know their God. They have no sense of belonging. They have a very frail sense of identity and personhood. They've never had any conversations about who God is or what his expectations are. They're slaves. They think like slaves, act like slaves. They have a slave-like mindset. And for 400 years, they've had no choices, no free will. And all of a sudden, they wake up one morning and they're free. Now, can you see a problem with that? 400 years, they don't get to think, they don't get to choose. And then all of a sudden, one morning, all they get to do is think and choose and decide and live. And they go up to Mount Sinai, and according to the story, Moses goes up to the mountain, and God gives this nation their first set of laws or rules. And at the start, we get a clue as to how religion and relationship and God and rules all fit together. And it begins with this. God spoke these words to Moses, and he's, here's what he said. He says, Moses, tell them, I am the Lord your God. First sentence. I am the Lord your God. Really? I'm the Lord your God. Well, if you're the Lord our God, then that would make us your people. Does that make sense? Well, how, how did that happen? And when did that happen? I mean, we haven't done anything. We've been slaves for 400 years, and where have you been? We've been for 400 years under the, under the thumb of Egypt. And now this guy Moses comes, and crazy things happen, and suddenly you're God, and we're your people. He goes on to say, I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am the Lord your God, the one who has done something for you, and you've done nothing for me. Well, well yeah, but, but we didn't know what the rules are. We don't even know if we've broken the rules or kept the rules because we don't have any rules yet. And it's like God says, I understand that. But before I give you the rules, I just want you to know something. Before we talk about the laws, before we talk about the thou shalt and thou shalt nots, I want you to know this one thing. I am your God, and you are my people. Let's establish that. Before we get to the rules, before we get to the rights and the wrongs, I want you to know one thing. I am your God, and you are my people. Now, the interesting thing that happened the night before that they left in Egypt while they were still there, God said something through Moses to the children of Israel. And you know what he said to them? He said, on the eve of their departure, he says, I want you to trust me. Tonight before you go to bed, I want you to take a lamb and I want you to slaughter it. And I want you to eat this lamb. But before you do, I want you to take the blood out of the lamb and I want you to go and smear it all over the doors and the sides of the door. And, and I want you just to trust me. Oh, okay, you want us to do what? Isn't that kind of gross, God? Yeah, but I just want you to trust me. I want you to do what I said. And so that night, the majority of the Jewish people had a special meal and they slaughtered the sheep. They took the blood and they put it down all the sides of the doorposts. And then they packed everything up because God said, in the morning, you're gonna leave. We've been here for 400 years and tomorrow morning, that's it? We're just gonna pack up and go? Uh-huh. As long as you make sure that you put blood on the doors. Trust, trust me. And that night, as the story goes, the death angel passed over all through Egypt. And everywhere where there was blood on the door, the death angel passed over that home. But where there was not blood on the door, the Bible says that the death angel moved in and killed the firstborn of every one of those family members. And the next morning, Pharaoh woke up. Even he had lost his firstborn. And out of anger, out of, out of a complete defeat, he said, go, take everything you own, just get out of here. And from that moment on till this day, the Jewish people would celebrate the festival of Passover to remember, not the Ten Commandments, not the laws of God, but to remember this night when God whispered to a nation and said, I want you to trust me. I'm your God. You are my people. Just trust me. 
And now three weeks later, they've gathered at Mount, the foot of Mount Sinai, and God says, okay, now I'm going to give you some, uh, some, of the, some of the laws, but, but let's make sure that we don't forget the most important thing. I am the Lord your God, and you are my people, and I am the one who has delivered you from slavery. Now, there are some things that I want you to do as we learn to live together, and, and I want you to, to live with one another better, and so then he goes on to give them the other nine commandments. Now, here's the amazing thing. He gives them the first commandment, and the first commandment is this. I am the Lord your God, you are my people. And the first commandment, is you won't have any other gods before me. Can you think, do you, do you get this? The first thing he does and talks about is not thou shalt or thou shall not. It's not an emphasis on the rule. He says the first commandment is relationship. There'll be no other gods but me. Let's get that straight. It wasn't okay, you do all these things and don't do all of these things and then you can be my people. It wasn't, you know what, here are a whole list of regulations. You keep them all and then you get to be my people and I get to be your God. No, 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 no. The Ten Commandments, here now, this is important. The Ten Commandments were a confirmation, not a condition of the relationship with God. The Ten Commandments, the laws of God, are a confirmation, not a condition of relationship with God. Not okay, you can, you can do all this and you can't do all of that and then you can be my people. No, 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 no. That may have been what you were told as a child. That may have what you've been raised of in, in, in church. But that's not what God was trying to do 4,000 years ago when he handed down the Ten Commandments. They were a confirmation, not a condition of the relationship. The oldest laws of God, 1,500 years before Jesus, as far back as we can go, and God starts off with this. I am your God. You are my people. Period. The rules and the regulations are a confirmation that we are in relationship together so that we can live in harmony and you can experience all of my best. And the rest of the Old Testament is a collection of stories and writings and, 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 and prof, prophetic, pro, the, the stories of the prophets and situations where God is trying to express just one thought. Obeying me is a confirmation of relationship, not a condition. Trust me. Trust me and live. Don't trust me and life is going to be just one big hurt. And then goes on and gives the other nine commandments, which by the way is going to be our summer series for July and August. We're going to look at what those rules were all about. Trust me and live. And even when you read about the exiles, and there are some really tough stories in the Old Testament, at the very root of every story, you will always hear somewhere in that story, I am not giving up on you, not because of what you have done, but because you are my people, and I chose you to be my people before I ever gave you a thou shall or a thou shalt not. No matter how badly I disobeyed my parents, and believe you me, I disobeyed my parents. But no matter how much I screwed my life up, I was always my father's son. Fellowship was broken. There were many times when, I, when things weren't right between my, my, my mother and my father and, and, and me. But at no point did mom and dad ever say, you're no longer my son. Fellowship was broken, but relationship was never broken, no matter what. And now the question is, what about you and God? How do you experience God today when it comes to rules and regulation. Is that what you think? Do you think that you have to keep the rules in order to keep God happy? And that as long as you keep the rules, then you're in. But if you don't keep the rules, then God says you're out. Is that what you think? Is that the model for you? The whole point of this series and starting again is for some of us to discover for the very first time and for other of us to be reminded afresh that faith in Jesus Christ is not about rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. If you remember nothing else, the bottom line of this, rules are confirmation, not a condition of a relationship with God. God is like a parent, and he only gives rules to people who are his kids, those who are in relationship with him. Now think about it. If that's true, if God's relationship with you is created in that way, and you can rebel and be disobedient, and some of you, you've gone way far left, and some of you have gone way far right, and, and you've done this over and over and over again, and you've had 25 starting points, and you're still not sure whether you're there or want to be there, and there's been disciplining and disciplining and disciplining and disciplining, understand this one thing. God does not discipline his children to pay you back. He disciplines you to bring you back. God is trying to bring you back into that relationship. I'm your God. You are my people. Let's do this together. And the rules, they're just to make your life better. And doesn't every parent think that? 
Isn't that why we create rules for our children? Because we want to give them the best life possible. When God made the promise to Abraham, as we looked at last week, or he initiated the relationship with Israel, as we talked about just now, one thing was for certain. It was for more than just Abraham or for Israel. God said, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And 1,500 years later, Jesus Christ walks into this narrative, this story of love. He turns the world upside down. He calms the storm. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. But at the very heart of everything that Christ does, he says this, trust me. Trust me. You know God, you see me, we are the same. And the promise that God fulfilled to Abraham, the promise that that God fulfilled through Israel was later on a promise that was established for all men and all women. In John chapter 12, it was John who was one of his followers said this, but to all who believe and accept him, he gave the right to become children. Family. And anything I require of you, God says, is evidence of my love for you. And Jesus says, anything that I ask of you, you can trust me. Because anything that I require of you is confirming of our relationship, affirming of the relationship. It's not conditional. It's not whether you're in or whether you're out. It confirms that we are together. So I got a question for you today. We're going to listen to a song that Justin's going to sing. And then here's what I want you to talk about. Growing up. Did you feel like religion was a family model for you? Like you're in, I love you, and you can never be thrown out. You're just part of the family, and it doesn't really matter, but, but you're just part of the family, and no matter what happens in your life, you'll always be in? Is that how you understood faith? Or perhaps you're, uh, you were taught the club model. If you keep your end of the deal, I'll keep my end of the deal, God says. As long as you follow the rules, then you are in. But if you don't follow the rules, then uh, you're out. And that all of your expression of faith and religion is all about making sure that you keep the rules. Or was it the neighborhood association? I won't throw you out. I can't throw you out. I really would if I could, but I can't because you're all in. But I'll tell you this. If you don't conform, if you don't figure out what the rules are, I'm going to make your life hell. I'm going to make you miserable. And I'm going to say all kinds of things and I'm going to make you feel guilty and I'm going to throw all kinds of things at you. I'll make you miserable until you decide to keep these rules. You're going to be on the outside looking in. So I want to pray with you. We'll listen to the song, give you a chance for you to talk with one another about what you see and how you see rules and relationship and you and God. Father, thank you so much for these incredible stories written down through the ages for thousands of years. And in grace and your mercy, would you open our eyes today to understand that the rules that you have set up are confirming that first and foremost, we are yours and you are ours. That we can have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. That our lives are not held because of the rules but that our lives are established in a relationship with you. And the rules, the rules just make life a whole lot better. Lord, whatever steps we think we need to take today, as you hear these words, would you give us the courage to take them and to move forward in faith? In Jesus' name I pray, amen.